I had a dream which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished and the stars did wander darkling in the eternal space, rayless and pathless, and the icy earth swung blind and blackening in the moonless air. Morn came and went and came and brought no day, and all hearts were chilled into a selfish prayer for light, and men were gathered round their blazing homes to look once more into each other's face. Happy were those who dwelt within the eye of the volcanoes and their mountain torch. A fearful hope was all the world contained. Forests were set on fire, but hour by hour they fell and faded, and the crackling trunks extinguished with a crash, and all was black. It was the disaster that shook the 1930s. One of America's finest and newest ocean liners had set to sea. Aboard were hundreds of holidaymakers and families, newlyweds and businessmen all coming back from Cuba. The voyage had been routine, fun, but then a shock. The captain, a well-liked veteran of the sea, died suddenly just before his ship found itself engulfed in a massive storm. And then, the next day, came the smell of smoke. With shocking ferocity, the SS Morrow Castle was consumed by a fire that ate its beautiful wood panelling and completely overwhelmed its beleaguered crew. Those left with no chance of escape faced two choices, jump or burn. On a popular holiday beach appeared the blackened hulk of the ship, and an incredulous public looked on with morbid curiosity even as the Morrow Castle's former passengers washed up around the wreck for days and weeks afterward. Initially deemed a tragic accident, the Morrow Castle's story passed from the headlines, but soon investigators began to unravel a different story. A story which painted one of the disaster's heroes in a very different light. Today, we're going to wind the clock back 90 years to board the Morrow Castle once more. We'll visit the scene of the disaster, retrace the ship's final tragic hours, and speak to experts in the field to unravel this nearly century-old story and determine, once and for all, if this terrible accident really was an accident at all. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. This is the terrifying true story of the SS Morrow Castle. Nineteen-thirties Havana. For years, American tourists had flocked to the Cuban capital, where the exotic climate and rich culture had long been a draw. Then, with prohibition, tourism boomed as thirsty Americans flocked for a drink. But beneath that happy facade, trouble was brewing. The Great Depression saw unhappiness come to a head. Violence erupted and terrorist groups conducted bombings across Cuba. In 1933, President Machado was forced into exile and a tug of war for control of the nation erupted. But even so, Americans streamed ashore, excited to spend their dollars on a carefree holiday in the sun, and many of them were taken there by the Ward Line and their ship, Morrow Castle. Mostly forgotten about today, the Ward Line was once a giant of the US East Coast, America's self-proclaimed oldest shipping line. It could trace its origins back to 1841, a humble beginning when James Otis Ward established a freight company. Four decades later, it traded under the name of New York and Cuba Mail Steamship Company, clearly outlining the market it wanted to corner. By the turn of the century, Ward Line had bought out their competition and operated a virtual monopoly on passenger and freight services between New York, Mexico, and most importantly, Cuba. 
So associated was Wardline with Cuba that to many, the two were synonymous. In fact, Ward's first ever steamship had even been named Cuba. Into the 1910s, the line went from strength to strength, building a succession of increasingly impressive steamships and making one of the finest reputations for safety at sea. Even during the First World War, the line seemed blessed. All of its ships survived the conflict, with its two stars, Havana and Saratoga, serving as hospital ships. Even then, before the war, Cuba had been a winter escape for many fortunate Americans seeking to get away from New York's freezing blizzards, but it was after the war that things really took off. A surge in the price of sugar saw Havana suddenly become one of the world's most important ports, and Ward Line was there to lap up the spoils. The company financed the construction of a new concrete dock system, which would see monstrous volumes of sugar taken from the island, virtually all aboard Ward Line ships at great profit. But while goods and freight made Ward Line the majority of its fortune, of course it was prohibition and the human cargo it provided that saw the line make happy profits too, because there was no end of weary American travellers keen to steam south for a few days to escape the drudgery of the United States without alcohol. In Havana there was cigars, dancing girls, palm trees, and booze. But while Wardline was the premier line running services to the island nation from its base at the end of Wall Street, Manhattan's South Street seaport, the company had let its fleet fall into disrepair. The Ward ships were ailing, old, slow, and doddering, and passengers couldn't help but notice. As the 20s wore on, the company ran into trouble as costs began to skyrocket. It nearly bankrupted them. But then, the US government came to their assistance. Maintaining a mail link with Cuba was in the American government's interests. It wouldn't do to see Wardline crumble. In fact, the state of the US Merchant Marine was a shambles, and Congress knew it. It passed the 1928 Merchant Marine Act that injected hundreds of millions of dollars into shipbuilding. Wardline jumped at the opportunity and had plans drawn up for two new, modern sister ships that would see the company into a whole new era. One would be named for the eastern province of Cuba, Oriente but the other would be named for the castle that had guarded the entrance to Havana's harbour since the 16th century. The Spanish had called it Castillo de los Tres Reyes Magos del Moro, but everyone knew it as the Moro Castle. At the time, the SS Moro Castle was lauded for its modernity. It represented the very best of American shipbuilding, and nearly everything about it was designed to be cutting edge. For the Ward Line, she represented an enormous step forward into a new technological era. She had been built by the experienced and well-regarded Newport News Shipbuilding Company, launched in March 1930 and finished for trials just five months later. She was 480 feet, some 146 metres long, and around 11,520 gross registered tonnes. She wouldn't be breaking any size records, but what she lacked for in size she more than made up for in amenities and technology. Inside the hull was packed a set of modern turboelectric engines. Steam, made from burning fuel oil in boilers, was fed at high pressure into turbines. The turbines span, and like giant dynamos, generated enormous amounts of electricity. This was fed into powerful motors, two of them which each drove a propeller. The arrangement meant Moro Castle and Oriente were both very efficient and decently quick, with a service speed of some 20 knots. For the service to Havana, this was blistering. The sisters set a record, and one of them could get to Cuba in just 58 hours, 40 minutes. Wardline's timing had been superb. In 1929, the US stock market crashed, but the company had managed to build two new modern ships that would help see them through the worst of it. Moro Castle set off on her maiden voyage on August 23, 1930, and delighted her passengers and her owners. Until then, Wardline had only lost two ships at sea, and never a single passenger in all its years of service. Its reputation for safety was unequalled. Moro Castle and Oriente were meant to continue that tradition, and by the latter part of 1934 they'd done it admirably. On Saturday, September 1st, at 4pm, the Moro Castle set out as usual from her dock at Pier 13, laden with cargo and cheerful passengers keen to escape the depression's woes. But while passengers waved excitedly to loved ones ashore, few, if any, could know that all was not well aboard Moro Castle, and that the ship had just one week left to live.
Surging along at 20 knots, Moreau Castle made her way south to Havana, her decks and public rooms alive with excited chatter and laughter. And what gorgeous rooms they were. Wardline had spared no expense in kitting their pride and joy out with some of the finest public rooms afloat on any American-built ship. Ward's brochures proudly showed off the towering dining saloon with its fine columns and balcony above, the light and airy veranda which served tea and refreshments, the raucous dance deck with the sprawling dance floor and ship-themed bandstand. But perhaps the crowning glory was the first-class lounge. Located nearly perfectly amidships on B-Deck, this magnificent room was as lofty as the dining saloon, with carved panels brilliantly varnished along its walls, lavish sofas dotting the sumptuous carpets, an incredibly welcoming room that could be turned easily into a ballroom for a dance. Behind it was the smoking room, suitably masculine, but forward of it were the library and the reading and writing room. The writing room was lighter than the lounge, with fine white panelled walls and gorgeous curtains hugging windows that ran nearly the height of the entire deck. Here, passengers could while away the hours reading or reporting home on postcards. The cabinet at one end held an impressive array of books that could be loaned for the voyage. This was early 1930s comfort at its very best, and the ward line made sure to use full colour illustrations to lure prospective passengers aboard, and aboard they came an assortment of characters all keen to enjoy what Morrow Castle had to offer. It was no secret that the Great Depression had done enormous damage to American business, especially at sea. Fair numbers dropped off enormously. Cargo and mail contracts kept the line afloat, but Oriente and Morrow Castle sailed back and forth every week with one of the ships leaving New York every Saturday, and the other leaving Cuba every Wednesday. Passengers needed to come along to keep the entire operation going, but with a crippling financial crisis well underway, few had cash to spare. The ward line began to offer bargain cruises that tempted even middle-class families into coming along for a holiday that would prove to be a once-in-a-lifetime experience. For just $65, less than the average month's wage, passengers could board at New York for a cruise to sunny, exotic Havana. The trip was billed as a six and a half day return voyage. Crucially, passengers were promised two days and one night in Cuba. It was an alluring deal. Some could even afford the more expensive offers, 10 day or even two week long holidays. With the two ships running back and forth every few days, passengers could stay in Havana at fine hotels, which the ward line could organize for minimal cost, all while enjoying line organized sightseeing tours and trips. Passengers were promised deck games and activities of all kinds, races, gala dinners. In the dance deck, nightly entertainment began at 9pm. There was even a dedicated cruise director. There was a gymnasium, a barber shop, even underage passengers were catered to with their own playroom. Morrow Castle and Oriente were floating pleasure palaces and tickets sold despite the fact Morrow Castle's mother nation was going through the toughest financial slump it had ever faced. For many, the temptation of Wardline's cruise deals just proved unavoidable, and they stepped aboard wide-eyed at their luxurious surroundings. As Morrow Castle slipped out of New York and into the Atlantic, passengers settled into their comfortable surroundings and got to know their ship. The first few days always proved rigid and formal, but the last few days of the voyage, especially the return, saw the most partying. But even so, as passengers danced the nights away or slept in the sun on deck, the happy facade of the ship hid some dark secrets that holidaymakers were blissfully unaware of. On the bridge stood Captain Robert R. Wilmot, a stout Englishman with three decades of ocean-going experience. He presided over his ship with an immense, almost tangible sense of pride, and where other captains shied away from the more social aspects of their role as ambassador for the line, Wilmot reveled in socialising with his passengers, giving tours of his ship, and keeping dinner tables enthralled with his tales of life at sea. He was so beloved by Ward Line's regulars that many chose to delay their voyages until they knew for certain that he would be aboard, and even though he was offered jobs with other lines, he chose to stay with Ward, a company man through and through. But Captain Wilmot's pleasant exterior belied some uncomfortable facts. 
First and foremost was his reluctance to conduct emergency drills. He was always hyper aware of his passengers sentiments, so much so he thought drills might unnecessarily panic them. When one passenger slipped on a leaking fire hydrant, he had it capped. In other cases, he turned off his ship's state-of-the-art smoke detection system in case it was accidentally triggered by smoke emitting cargo or cigars. This skirted protocols, but so long as his passengers were happy, he was content. His crew was another thing entirely. The Morrow Castle may have been the darling of the ward line and the American Merchant Marine, but she was very far from being a happy ship. Ships are strange places. They are, for their crews, both a workplace and a home. The kinds of politics, bickering and resentment that can arise in any job place can fester and intensify at sea to unprecedented levels. Captain Wilmot presented a facade of easy-going coolness. His ship looked to be running like clockwork. But the sad truth is that the crew members were poorly paid, extremely discontent, and ruled over by the ward line with cruel indifference. Many jumped ship. It left the Morrow Castle, with its gruelling weekly schedule, understaffed. The crew who remained worked overtime to double up their workload for a tiny extra pay. With the depression in full swing and wages pathetically low, as little as $30 per month at a time when the national average was around 100, times were tough and discontent turned to desperation. But there, at the other end of the voyage, was Cuba and opportunity. Some seized it. Morrow Castle's cargo typically consisted of the usual goods, Cuban sugar, amongst other banal things, but the cash-strapped crew began to take on unsanctioned goods. Marijuana. It was grown in patches around Havana's streets, then heroin and cocaine to peddle back in New York. Then there was the booze. Cuban rum fetched a premium back in Prohibition-era USA, and sure enough, cases and cases of the stuff found their way aboard the Ward Line's sister ships. But so too did weapons. Firearms and explosives were routinely shipped between New York and Havana, but always off the books. And then there were people. Even though it was gripped by the Depression, America still stood as the land of opportunity for many in Latin America. To find passage into the United States in the wake of a new immigration quota set by a 1924 Act seemed nearly impossible, and some found illegitimate ways of doing it. Morrow Castle frequently sailed badly underbooked. With so many empty cabins, it was easy for crew members to make a buck smuggling Cubans back into the States, literally locking them into unused cabins for the three-day long voyage. It was a dirty business, but times were tough, and the old law of supply and demand reigned. Beneath the feet of Morrow Castle's excited honeymooners and retirees were huddled Cuban refugees, desperate mothers, children, and students fleeing the violent unrest of their mother nation. The crew was unhappy. The situation aboard verging on volatile, and overseeing all of it was Captain Wilmot. But instead of dealing with it, he glossed over the issues as easily as his crew painted over rust with gleaming white paint. Morrow Castle steamed on for Havana, but it was the last time she'd ever see her home port again. After just a few short days sailing, Morrow Castle steamed past the fortification which had given her her name. It was the entrance to the port of Havana. For passengers, it carried the prospect of some exciting time off. With the ship tied up at the pier, they stepped off to explore this new and exciting land, but behind remained the crew, who now had a good job of unloading and loading cargo and turning down the ship's staterooms for a fresh group of passengers heading back north for New York the next day. Down to the docks they came in their dozens, walking up the gangway, back from a holiday that had thrilled and refreshed them. Nearly a full third of the passengers were members of the Concordia Singing Society, a German group out of New York. Dozens of couples with ties to the group boarded, including policeman Adolf Kostbother and his wife Mary, berthed down on D-deck opposite the Hagedorns, Minnie and Henry. Then there were all the newly married couples, like Charles and Selma Filzer, honeymooners from New York. Charles was a tall, handsome 20-something businessman with a pencil moustache that made him look like a movie star. Selma was kind and playful. The pair would often banter in their letters back and forth with one another. When Charles was away on business, once Selma had sent him a postcard from a sunny holiday. Selma, you wuss, he had written back. 
It's bad enough sending me a postcard with an alluring picture of a swimming pool and palms without having the effrontery to rub it in. I hope you get a healthy case of prickly heat, or at least a freckled nose. The two had paid for a $225 first class cruise package, and Oriente had taken them to Cuba. Now Morrow Castle would take them home. The Filtzers were far from the only newlyweds aboard. There were the Cohens too, Abraham and Harriet who'd just been married in late August. Abraham, 31, had once been a sports champion in school but turned his attentions to business. Harriet, meanwhile, 21 years of age, was from a migrant family and worked in the finance branch of a department store. Then there was Paul and Marjorie Giannini, hard-working newlyweds from Brooklyn. He was a dental surgeon who lived above his office. Marjorie had grown up knowing Paul's family. With little money to finance a big Italian wedding, the pair had eloped in secret, and the short $65 cruise deal was the perfect cover for them to escape the ensuing outrage back home. As Morrow Castle's passengers found their cabins and settled in, her 231 crew made their own arrangements down below, positioning cargo in the holds and preparing the ship for departure. But here, it's thought that some of them may have taken the opportunity to make a profit, smuggling the usual contraband, drugs, and even people. Desperate Cuban families pleaded with crew to take their children far away to the land of opportunity, where they could be met up with later. It's thought that in the chaos of boarding day, many lone children found their place aboard the ship, down below in cabins with meager rations for the three-day voyage. At the other end, the crew member who'd arranged their passage would let them out where they could meet waiting family in New York City. They were locked in for the days to come. Morrow Castle, fully loaded with fuel, provisions and people, sat low in the water, but she made steam and her engines thumped, and soon she left Havana behind her, never to return. The return voyages to New York were always the most fun. With holidays coming to an end, passengers cut loose and partied before their return to reality. The mood was festive, and that was in large part thanks to cruise director Bob Smith. If Wilmot was master of the ship, then Smith was master of the fun to be had aboard. With his big smile and his jocular nature, Smith was as popular amongst his passengers as the captain. It was he who organised the sports games, the horse racing, and even sightseeing tours around Havana. Under his purview, passengers could even enjoy a putting green during their days at sea. But Smith was at odds with his captain over another critical activity, life jacket drills. He wanted passengers to be practised at finding their life jackets, putting them on, and gathering at muster stations. But Wilmot thought excessive drills would panic passengers and put the thought of death at sea, the Titanic, the Lusitania, in their heads in the middle of their carefree voyage. Ever the people pleaser, Wilmot put his passenger's comfort above all else and rejected Smith's idea. It's safer on the ship, he said, than at Broadway and 42nd Street. Wilmot got his wish. The 318 passengers certainly enjoyed Wardline's floating pleasure palace. No doubt the newlyweds and the honeymooners mixed and chatted excitedly, danced the nights away. For children especially, the Morrow Castle must have seemed absolutely vast in scale. Mervyn Bregstein, eight, was aboard with his father, Joseph, a dentist from Brooklyn. But aside from being a fun family holiday, there was a secret purpose to the trip. Joseph had been widowed in early 1933, but now he intended to remarry. It had been an immense trial for both father and son, and Joseph paid for the trip to soften the blow and tell his son the news. As Mervyn explored the ship, Joseph worked up the courage to have the difficult conversation with his son. Then there was the Saints family, Maria and her husband, Cuban surgeon Braulio. They were travelling to New York with their three children, Marta, 11, Margarita, 8, and Braulio Jr., 13, who had his own cabin. The family travelled relatively often, and they lived well. In 1927, they'd taken a transatlantic voyage on the Olympic. On this voyage, their cabins were on A-deck, Morrow Castle's boat deck, and they were among the finest the ship had to offer. The orchestra played, the engines rumbled, but on the horizon, a thick grey cloud loomed. A freshening breeze plucked at Captain Wilmot's cap and his veteran years at sea told him what it meant. A storm, a big one, lay directly ahead. Wind howled and the ship pitched and rolled as it began to encounter bigger and bigger waves. The weather had shifted just as Wilmot knew it would, 
And inside, public rooms and corridors, the Morrow Castle's ornate panelling began to creak and groan as the hull bent and flexed. For many, the motion of the ship would have brought the dreaded mal de mer, seasickness. Passengers not used to it were confined to their staterooms to try and ride it out, and do their best to ignore the nausea. The captain was complaining of stomach pain too, but it wasn't seasickness. Wilmot was 55, and in seemingly good health, but he began to suffer chest and stomach pains. The captain's job is stressful enough to be sure, but Wilmot's mind must have dwelt on the myriad problems of the ship under his command, the unhappy crew, and the unstable situation in Cuba. He shied away from his passengers, unusual for such a gregarious character, and consulted with the ship's doctor, Van Zyl. If anything were to happen to Wilmot, command would probably pass on to his second in command, Chief Officer William Worms. Where Wilmot was a commanding, cheerful presence, Worms was more reserved and bitterly disliked by the crew. His pride may have been stung by the fact that when Wilmot had been absent in the past, command had not passed to Worms, but instead temporary captains had been brought aboard specifically. The crew's dislike of Worms stemmed from his command style. Many of them thought he simply had none, that he lacked the leadership capability that made men like Wilmot natural figures in control of their ship. But still, Worms knew Morrow Castle well, and she was in good hands even with the skipper in unusually poor health. As the day wore on, the seas became bigger, and the unmistakable signs of a developing nor'easter threatened to check Morrow Castle's headway. On her way into New York, she'd need to battle a strong headwind and heavy seas, but the most modern ship in Wardline's fleet was well equipped to handle it. Bob Smith, the cruise director, was making the final preparations for the farewell party, a raucous tradition on the final night of the voyage, which culminated in a roaring dance contest. It all began with a lavish dinner. But conspicuously absent was Captain Wilmot. His seat at the captain's table was vacant, and the passengers, who so enjoyed his company and even chose to travel specifically with him, were annoyed at the absence. The captain was instead in his cabin, and his steak and vegetable dinner did nothing to settle his stomach. He'd phoned up to ask Dr. Van Zyl to mix him an enema, but then fell silent. His crew left him alone to get over his stomach pain, and the night continued on. Outside, the winds picked up, and by about 7pm they were screaming at over 30 miles, nearly 50 kilometres per hour. Morrow Castle's bow lifted over and surged into wave troughs, but her powerful electric engines meant she should be able to make it into New York with little delay, just as her builders had intended. Chief Officer Worms was at dinner with friends when he got a sudden interruption and shocking news from the bridge. He jumped from the table and made his way topside where he found Dr. Van Zyl wearing a dark expression on his face. Captain Wilmot was dead. The news was like a gunshot that spread through the ship with alarming speed. It began as a rumour amongst the crew before making the leap, like a wildfire, to the passengers. Except it wasn't a rumour, it was true. The chief engineer had tried to phone Wilmot up to report a boiler issue, but he got no answer. Around 7pm, the captain was found draped over his bathtub, stone dead, and Dr. Van Zyl had given a cursory pronouncement of acute indigestion. The ward line's most beloved captain was no more, and with his passing, there was left a burning question. Who would take his place? With Morrow Castle headed into the developing storm, a deft hand was needed to guide the ship through the worst of the weather, but whose? Chief Officer Worms wasted no time in sending an urgent radio message ashore to Wardline officials telling them the news about Wilmot, but it might have been a move more aimed at assuming control of the situation more than anything. Many of the crew favoured Chief Engineer Eben Abbott to take control, but in the end Worms' telegram cemented his authority and he took control of the ship. His first act was to ensure that each officer beneath him was subsequently promoted up one rank to assume the duties of running the ship safely through the storm. But then, he turned his attention back to Wilmot. Worms thought it best to maintain the scene where the captain had been found and locked the body in his quarters. Then he called for cruise director Bob Smith. The night's festivities were to be cancelled in deference to the old skipper's passing. Smith took on perhaps the most difficult task he'd yet experienced when he took centre stage in the dining saloon and announced, through a megaphone, the captain's death. The happy mood of the passengers was doused immediately, and Smith went through most of the main public rooms to make his announcement, even going to individual groups and interrupting gently by saying, I have some sad news. The party was cancelled, but passengers were told the bars would still be staffed. They huddled in small groups and chatted quietly, but many turned in for the night. 
Overhead, the rain fell in sheets and the Morrow Castle groaned under the strain of every big wave. The ship was just hours from home, but she'd be arriving without the supervision of her popular, experienced captain. As the night wore on and the small groups of quiet passengers began to disperse, Warm stayed in quiet vigil on the bridge watching the big waves break over the ship's bow and intent on seeing the liner into New York. He was achingly tired, and he ignored his crew who suggested he get some rest. This task, guiding the big ship into New York, was a test of his mettle, and to pull it off would show Wardline that he was indeed Captain Material. Throughout the ship, as the 7th of September became the 8th, and the hours passed by, lights began to be doused in empty public rooms, and stewards cleared tables of glasses and finished cigars. Just after 1.30am, the ship cleared Barnegat Light. New York was a little over 70 miles, or 114 kilometres away. In the smoking room, around 2.45am, a steward, Daniel Campbell, was serving a table of gentlemen who refused to retire for the evening, when he was suddenly interrupted by a passenger who asked if he could smell smoke. It was a funny question to ask in a smoking room, but the passenger said it seemed to be coming instead from the lounge. Campbell could have dismissed the man because passengers raised false alarms all the time, but with little else to do at such a late hour, he followed him into the next room and found, alarmingly, that he was right. Something was burning. He stepped into the reading and writing room, and then he saw it, smoke pouring out from the cracks in the door of a small cabinet. He reached for the handle, but it burned his hands. He sprang back in pain, and the door swung open. It was like the boiler furnace from a steam locomotive. Hissing and glowing red hot, the inside of the cabinet had been completely consumed by flames, but with the sudden inrush of oxygen, the fire reared and surged, burning a fierce blue-white. Campbell ran for help, and another steward rushed to grab a fire hose. On the bridge, William Warms paced back and forth, he wasn't supposed to be on watch, in fact, second officer Clarence Hackney was on the middle watch that early morning. With just a few short hours to go until rounding Sandy Hook spit and taking on the pilot for New York, Worms was determined to see his ship home. But his ceaseless pacing and his unwarranted presence made the middle watch crew nervous. Then, with a bang, the door to the bridge burst open and a breathless night watchman barked out a simple warming. There's a fire, he roared. Smoke was rising slowly from the mouth of a deck vent which ran straight through down into the public rooms. It was obvious cause for alarm, but Worms took the situation in hand. Get down there, he said to Second Officer Hackney. See if there's a fire. Hackney rushed below, fire extinguisher in hand. Fifty feet away near the radio room, wireless operator George Alanya, 21 years old, woke up startled by the sound of rushing feet. The junior radio operator had been on shift and he could smell smoke too. He burst into the cabin where the chief radioman, George Rogers, was asleep and tried to rouse him. As Alanya sat himself down at the set, Rogers pushed him out of the way and took control, tuning the set to the distress frequency, but then he stopped. A distress call required direct authority from the bridge, but attempts to use the phone line proved futile when the line crackled and died. Smoke began to pour into the room. With Rogers sat waiting at the set, Alanya rushed out to the bridge to see what was going on. Down below, passengers were disturbed from their slumber by commotion in the lounge. First class passenger Doris Wacker had joined friends for a private party in Suite 17, a stateroom which opened directly out onto the lounge's balcony. It gave her a superb view of the room below, normally full of happy passengers, light music and idle chatter. But as she left her friend's cabin to go back to her own, the flicker of light caught her attention. She peered out over the railing and down into the well, where crew struggled with buckets to throw water onto a roaring fire in the writing room. Around the same time, Second Officer Hackney burst into the lounge to see a sight that took his breath away. Flames spread wildly out of the reading and writing room and began to eat the luscious carpet of the lounge. It roared angrily and crackled as varnished timber was consumed with voracious speed. Stuarts desperately threw buckets of water onto it, but it was like warding off an angry, charging bull with a spray bottle. The battle to save Morrow Castle had begun, but the crew had no idea it was already over. The 
for the ship's 318 passengers and 231 crew, a countdown had started that would see their ship consumed completely from stem to stern by flames, a fire that would roar through their ship, cutting off escape routes and trapping dozens where they slept. In the radio room, Chief Operator George Rogers sat patiently, the smoke beginning to sting his nostrils. He was unmoved by the drama and waited quietly for Alanya to return from the bridge with orders from Worms. Through his headset, he heard a message crackle out into the night. It was from a nearby freighter and asked if anybody had information about a ship they had spotted burning in the darkness. A New Jersey shore station responded that they had no idea, but Rogers stayed quiet. The thought of fire didn't concern him. In fact, he was quite used to dealing with them. And besides, he may have known all about the ship's fire before anyone else. Morrow Castle was just miles from home, but she was burning. In part two of Inferno, the burning of Morrow Castle, fire rips through the ship and leaves it a charred hulk. Dozens are forced to take their chances in the surging ocean, where rescue is slow to come. The ship washes up at a popular resort town to the bewilderment of thousands, and as investigations begin to turn up more questions than answers, Captain Wilmot's death and the ship's burning begins to look less and less like an accident, and a hero of the disaster turns out to have a very dark past. We'll visit the Morrow Castle's final resting place at Asbury Park, New Jersey, and speak with friend of the channel, researcher and author Caitlin Doty, on the difficult task of retrieving the ship's victims. We'll try to piece the clues together to understand what really caused the inferno, the burning of SS Morrow Castle. Not so far from here, there's a very lively atmosphere. Everybody's going there this year. And there's a reason the season opened last July. Ever since the USA went dry, everybody's going there and I'm going to. I'm on my way to Cuba, there's where I'm going. Cuba, there's where I'll stay. Cuba, where wine is flowing, and where dark eyed Stellas light their fellas, Panatellas. Cuba, where all is happy. Cuba, where all is gay. Why don't Plan a wonderful trip to Havana. Hop on a ship and I'll see you in C U B A.